Generation Podcast Production. Empowering yourself to taking responsibility. So even if it wasn't your fault, it's still your responsibility. If somebody hits your car tomorrow, it ain't your fault. You still got to deal with the auto mechanics, the insurance. You got to deal with that. That's your responsibility. So lying down and self-pity and being a victim, there's no value to that. So finding out where your responsibility is in this is empowering. Because when you take responsibility, you take power. And if it's always somebody else's fault, then you're left powerless. It's your boy, Humble the Poet. I am a spoken word artist, rapper, MC, designer, poet. I live through art. And today, I was on Living Through Love with Ruben, discussing the artist's journey, discussing love, discussing politics, discussing life, and my new book, How to Be Loved, which coincidentally, that beautiful cover that you guys are going to see somewhere on this webpage was created by the one and only Ruben. And uh, you have the opportunity to pre-order it and get a special gift if you go to humblethepoet.com slash Ruben, R-U-B-E-N. You will get not only get special digital gifts, as well as a chance to win my entire collection and a chance to win a one-on-one coffee date with me. Not only will you get all those cool gifts, but you will also get something exclusive just from the Ruben Live Through Love community. Humblethepoet.com slash Ruben. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Live Through Love. I'm your host, Ruben Rojas, and thank you for tuning in. All right, Humble, thank you for joining us. Thank you for coming into the studio today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. So, like, I just met you, right? We had a mutual friend that connected us. Yes. You came in, yes, and we just—it's like we've been brothers, yeah, right. And we've been doing the same thing at different parts of the world, in our own ways. But it's all through creativity and words and art and music. And here we are today. It's like we picked up where we left off, but I have no idea where it started. Where we left off, right? Yeah, in a previous iteration, right? Another life, universe, life, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But also, it could be the the common flow of just artistry you know like say real recognize real artists recognize artists right mission recognize mission something like that Mm -hmm. or the frequency we're operating on too yeah and shout out to lewis house it was literally me telling him we're on a hike and i just said i'm not enjoying la i am looking for reasons to enjoy la and he's like you're not hanging out with any artists you're hanging out with entertainers i need you to meet my man ruben let me connect you on instagram and that's, yeah. we're sipping on smoothies right in north hollywood and then that's all it was nice and then, thank you lewis thank you brother thank you man i got a new brother because of you so how did you become humble let's talk about how you got here yeah i have been writing forever when i was eight years old i wrote a story called the revenge of the teacher which was a big rip off of the freddy krueger films mm. literally instead of freddy, freddy krueger killing a bunch of kids it was my teacher killing a bunch of kids and Back in the 80s, that didn't raise any flags. Nobody called child services on me for writing the story. Mm -hmm. And the story itself got popped because I mentioned every kid in the class and just had funny ways of the teacher killing them, sticking some kid's head in the um, pencil sharpener, throwing a kid through a window, just whatever I've seen on TV. I wrote a book about it. And teacher rolled her eyes, thought it was hilarious. And I, you know, the book went 80s viral. I got to read it every day for a week, you know, which is a big deal amazing back then in the third grade yeah and that got me into creative writing and i was always writing ever since that got into music loving everything and um then i became an elementary school teacher and i was working as a school teacher and that was the first time i wasn't a student even though i was still in school and uh figuring out what i could do with my off time and you know walking to a coffee shop saw a sign about open mic night mm. saw a lot of pretty girls in the room so i was like this is a fantastic opportunity to, to you know showcase what i have which mm-hmm. was like three poems at the time performed finished second among four poets you know 
it was, a, it was an icebreaker and it got it, it broke the ice with the women in in, in the coffee shop and mm -hmm. I, was like, I should do more of this this is a great incentive to do it and this is probably like 2007 2008 mm -hmm. started recording it on the little skinny cell phones and uploading that onto youtube which had just started mm -hmm. people started showing up to the open mics to see me because they found me on youtube and they saw where i was performing and it organically took a life of its own never thought in my life i could be a full-time artist mm -hmm. uh that transferred into music as i put music in the back of my poetries i started rapping grew up on hip-hop um started rapping releasing music and now as a teacher the, the students all knew me as a teacher who swore in his music and uh again just did it for fun mm -hmm. did it did it for the ego strokes did it for whatever you know thought extremely small thought you know life could not be beyond what it was and you know keep my head down work hard maybe i'll be a principal in 10 years yeah and uh started meeting more creatives more artists and uh eventually an, uh, a, a, a specific producer came up to me and he was like man we could you know your, your work's too important for us to be doing this part-time let's go full-time let's let's do it i know mm. some dudes in japan that will pay you money to write songs for all their little pretty boy artists and it'll be great yeah sent me a contract and i was like oh crap this is more money than i'm gonna make in two years as a teacher yeah quit my job pursuing that took a year of procrastination and denial to realize that it wasn't happening this deal was either non-existent fraudulent or something in between um but the dude that set it up disappeared once i started questioning him wow and then i was unemployed in debt and uh had no idea how artists made a living and then i think that was like the, the real beginning of the story all the rest were the like false starts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh I started writing to myself to like get through it and try to I realized how much I had to unlearn and I would literally write to myself every single day started sharing that on Facebook and that built a community of people who connected with the words like all the comments were like it's like you live inside my head and then the, the next set of popular comments was like you should write a book mm. and then I was like I don't know how to write a book and then somebody would send me an article how to self-publish a book how to yeah. use Amazon create space how to use KDB publishing how to get your books on Barnes and Noble online, how to use uh, Adobe InDesign to format a book. So they were just like ripping out all the pages of excuses that I had. Mm -hmm. And uh, very slowly um, I built a book. The book was called Unlearn. It took me a year and a half to write it and about a year to figure out how to put it together and mm. put it for sale. Released that, I believe in 2014, I crowdfunded it and 300 people contributed money and i raised about 25 grand it's amazing um the biggest contributor was a harvard professor that i had never met in my life and he just said i really appreciated that you took your business into your own hands i eventually went out there to boston to see him and uh he showed me this quote by andy warhol that said art is the most important art is the most interesting type of business mm -hmm. business is the most interesting type of art and uh and he's like a lot of artists don't use their creativity in the world of business mm -hmm. and i was you know for me it was a necessity because i had no money yeah and um started this kind of journey of kind of the suit and the artist you know one foot and the other and operating and the book was selling three copies a week then i got up to three copies a day and uh still started releasing music new opportunities started coming and then in 2017 I, uh, by then I'd kind of figured out how, different ways to make money, whether it was selling merchandise, whether it was uh, doing live performances, whether it was ghostwriting for other people, um, different opportunities were finding me. And um, in 2017, I ended up doing an Apple commercial in Canada, uh, the first shot on iPhone commercial that they had to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday. Amazing. wrote a poem for that performed at that that kind of raised my profile got mm -hmm. me a few more opportunities and then it got on one of the biggest bookstores out there indigo on their radar that i had books so they reached out to me and said can we license your book we know you have one can we sell it in our stores mm. and i was like gotta email you a pdf and I'm like yep that's it did that and then the book became a bestseller once it hit their shelves wow. kind of entered the mainstream and then through that Got connected with an agent out here. Then I signed with HarperCollins and then released two more books with them. 
and um, always still making music on the side, creating, you know, visual arts on clothing, um, always shooting my own music videos and visuals. So just exploring uh, different ideas mm. and kind of the overall theme of unlearning has always just been there. Like, what did I think life was supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Why do I think that way? What do I have to do to realize that it could be something else? And try not to crystallize myself and always realizing it was it always went back to just being a kid and wanting a new experience you know mm -hmm. when you're a kid every year is a new teacher a new desk new classroom new situation mm -hmm. eventually a new school you know and then you become an adult and it's like day in and day out you're in the same place yeah so i think for me i was always chasing that newness all mm -hmm. the time and since i've been so it's been 10 years as a full-time artist and no two days are the same and um the longer you do it the more confidently you can say, I have not seen it all. Mm. And um, that brings me to here. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, there's so much right there. Obviously, that journey is much longer than those yes, few minutes. Significantly longer. Um, yeah. But let's just talk about some of the, the emotions that you went through. Like, what did it feel like? Before that book got picked up, you know, the vulnerability and sharing, I've shared a, a poetry book or even just putting out a poem. I used to be like, wow, well, what are people going to think? Even though I wrote it for me, yeah. I still had that, like, yeah. I need that ego validation or yeah. that. So how did it feel just being that vulnerable, but also in a, a low part of your time where you needed yeah. to make money? You, yeah. you weren't employed. You were like in this transition of yeah. feeling maybe slighted. Yeah. What Completely. Um, there were many iterations of that. I think when I first, first, first started and I was releasing lyrics videos on YouTube with songs I was making, mm -hmm. Humble the Poet was the mask. I didn't use my name. I didn't, I didn't want people to know who, I, who it was, yeah. and who I was. And it wasn't until like I was at a wedding and someone recognized my voice from hearing me speak. They're like, you're the guy dropping those poetry. Because I was dropping stuff daily. Mm. It's like, you're the guy. Because there was no visuals. It's just scrolling lyrics. Yeah. And, and he was thanking me because I was talking about social issues. Uh, most, I, I grew up in a, a, a lot of social justice-based uh, causes, a mindset to look out for that. Mm -hmm. So I was rapping about what was happening in Palestine, what was happening um, you know, uh, in India, what was happening in Sri Lanka, what was happening in North America, just different situations, mm -hmm. hunger in Africa and stuff like that. So, and, and, and things that were even happening on a local level and mentioning very local situations that people were going through. So... Initially, that was it. And then I remember the first time I kind of made a Facebook group. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's when Facebook group for the thing. Like, hearing my sisters, like, like promote me and be like, oh, my God, they know it's me. And, like, they're proud of me for doing it. Like, mm -hmm. nobody is talking me out of it. And it's just, you know, because you, you build up this thing in your head about judgment and fear. Yeah. And then, you know, and this is like, I'm, I'm, I'm still gainfully employed. I'm not taking it seriously. This is just a, a side fun thing. But then when I left my job to pursue it full time, everybody on the outside thought I quote unquote made it, mm. you know? And meanwhile, I was even worse off than I had ever been in my life. Yeah. And there was probably about three months of me hiding from everybody, including my family, not telling anybody that things were wrong. Mm -hmm. And my family could think, you know, we have a connection. They knew something was wrong, especially my mom. Um, so when I finally came clean to them, you know, it, I'm like, you know, things aren't going well. I ran out of money. I have to move out of the place. I, I, I lived in a condo that I owned, that I had purchased with, mm -hmm. with my teaching money. I had to sell it mm. to pay off my debts. And um, I had to move back home. And, uh, you know, you, I tell my parents how I messed up. I tell my parents, you know, all the, the financial, uh, the poor financial decisions I made. And it wasn't open arms. There yeah. was, there was, I told you so. There was, wait a minute, you know, there was digging deep. Like, it's, can, can't wrap our head around how you messed up this bad. Like, yeah. it wasn't like, it's okay, baby, come home. Mm -hmm. It was, it's okay, come home. Let's feed you. Let's get you back. Because I lost like 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. I, I went like, I think probably right now I'm about 170. I was about 141 at that wow. point. And I think I, I have a picture of it. I printed out just me at my lowest. I, I was just bones and beard mm -hmm. pretty much <laughs> and uh, yeah when i moved back home i could tell like my mom's only concern was feeding me you know immigrant kids you the rounder the better mm -hmm. and um but there there still was this i told you so from them because they never wanted me to, to leave my job in the first place yeah 
And I survived that. That was, that was part of a worst case scenario. And then it also helped me realize that my real worst case scenario was embarrassment. It wasn't death. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be homeless. I had a family s system. Not everybody has yeah. that. Uh, and that's something to be grateful for. And then I kind of leaned in on that. And, you know, I had friends who had lent me money. I went and had conversations with them, said, look, I owe you money. I don't have your money, but you're not going to see me taking trips to Mexico. You're not going to see me rocking new clothes. Yeah. You're not going to see me doing anything in the meantime other than trying to figure out how to get you your money. Yeah. But I don't have it. And I also don't want to avoid you. Mm -hmm. And I also don't want this to break up our friendship. Um, and then as other people, you know, who would just see stuff from the outside and this, you know, because there's still a, a level of social media then, you know, I would be honest with them. Like, how are things going? Oh, my God, I heard you performed at Lollapalooza. I was like, yeah, but I actually got paid 50 bucks to perform at Lollapalooza. I had to pay for my flight. I had to pay for my hotel. I had to pay for my food. So I probably lost about $800 on that trip. And but yeah, it was fun. And I, you know, I stole a. I stole a roll of duct tape from the stage as a memento. But I think just being open and honest, what I realized was I didn't, probably telling my parents was the most judgmental experience I had. Mm. Telling everybody else what I realized opened the door for them to be vulnerable with me. Mm. So when I told them like things aren't going well, I have no money, I don't know how to make money, I don't know what's happening. A lot of that, I think that made people be like, I know how that feels. Like mm. I'm also struggling with this. I'm also, so I realized that vulnerability encourages vulnerability which in itself creates an authentic connection yeah whereas i think most of the time we're encouraged to pretend that everything is great um right social media life versus real life social media versus real life and it's like you know if we were just a lot more vulnerable and honest we would have a, a much deeper connection um and encourage other people to be just as vulnerable so i think in all those moments as i got more and more vulnerable combined with the fact that I put words together for a living. That's that's my 10,000 hours. That's my mm -hmm. craft. So I was helping other people get their thoughts into words. I was helping them. Because a lot of us leave it in our heads and our mm -hmm. thoughts are fragmented. Um, even the simple act of writing it out on a journal, the simple thought, the simple act of saying it out loud brings mm -hmm. it out into the sun and disinfects it. Helps mm -hmm. you realize, wait, it's not as bad as I thought. Or wait, I, I, I let it all out and I kind of already feel lighter. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's not even about having a solution. It's just writing it out. And um, I learned very quickly that having that level of vulnerability with people um, and not because there was no benefit. Because somebody I had lent, that had lent me money. He when I was a teacher, I was driving a nice car. I was, I was I was originally living at home when I was working. So was, all my money was my money when at least a nice car. And I remember he had lent me money and I went, had gone to him with the hey, this is the situation. I'll get you your money back, but I don't have it right now. And his response was, do you need more? Make mm. sure you don't lose that car because then people will know you're struggling. Mm. And I was like, your heart is big, but your priorities are not things I want to share. Yeah. Um, I don't care if people know I'm struggling. And I don't want to be in more debt to you to keep up a lifestyle. So thank you, mm -hmm. but no thank you. But it, it was this kind of indicator that... You know, and he, he was older, so it was like, you know, the, we were raised by a generation that believed in that. Um, so I think for me, I realized it was a lot more freeing to just be like, no, nah, I'm, I'm struggling. I can't afford anything. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm scared half the time. I just moved back home with mommy and dad. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I'm eating good. And now I have time to, like, lick my wounds and figure my stuff out because I'm not struggling to mm -hmm. see what I can tear off my walls and sell on Craigslist to pay my mortgage yeah. uh, or buy food. But now I have to figure this out. And, and you need that space to start figuring things out. And then realizing that this is not only for me to work through, this is also a service for, for everybody else. Yeah. You know, so, and, and we talked about the importance of art. It's just that, it's working through something. And then you share that journey. Mm -hmm. It's not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, it's the, it's the rainbow. Mm -hmm. You're sharing that journey. And then that's the journey that somebody else might, we talked about this, that that's the journey that somebody else might build off of. That's the journey that somebody might rip off and try to profit off of mm -hmm. temporarily. It doesn't last. Um, and that's the journey that can simply just make somebody realize they're not alone. Yeah. You know, like seeing love could be the difference between somebody picking a fight with their partner while they're sitting in a parking lot. Definitely. And just being like, let me take a brief, let me take a five more seconds before I open my mouth. And mm -hmm. make things 
better instead of worse. So I think that helped me really realize like leaning on love, how leaning on love and leaning on art and how important that was. And I mean, now it's looking at, I look at vulnerability as, you know, I think more people would want to be vulnerable if they knew how. And uh, everybody thinks that there's this invisible judgmental, like society wants, like, who is society? Mm-hmm. You're, you're society, I'm society. There's no society, you know. It's, it's de- like society is everything else but not us. Yeah, but yeah. not us. And I hear, you know, in, especially being in LA, you hear stuff like, oh, you can't, you can't go to brunch wearing those shoes. They won't let, you know, like they, they'll look at you. Funny. I'm like, who's they? Because yeah. right now I'm thinking you're they. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're telling me about having to wear a certain type of shoes to go into a certain type of restaurant to have brunch. And mm-hmm. I don't think, and I think we, we end up being both the prisoners and the guards of this bullshit. And not even realizing it, though. Not realizing it. You know, it's like, I wasn't allowed to do it, so you're not allowed to do it. And I think that's the thing that I realized very quickly by because I actually didn't have anything and there wasn't and it also I felt like there was no incentive at that point to pretend like there was no one to impress no one you know my my friends were my friends they didn't care either yeah. way my family is my family they didn't care either way and well, there's then, the fake until you make it attitude right that everyone a lot of people preach I mean maybe you know, and as I said, this is just subconscious. Like, like right. I don't know why I like chocolate ice cream more than vanilla. There's something there that makes me like one over the other. So maybe, you know, maybe if you're a real estate agent, you pull up in a nicer car, people take you more serious. Yeah. I get that. Um, I don't know. I feel like with art, if we were gonna if we were gonna like reduce it to 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 that, I think it's the people who are consuming your art are asking what's in it for me. Mm-hmm. So I don't really think I agree there, yeah. Yeah, so give give them stuff that they can use, and then they'll keep coming back. Mm -hmm. I don't think they necessarily care what car I'm driving, unless I'm creating art around aspiration. Mm -hmm. If you're Jay Z, by all means, make sure your car matches the stuff you're rapping about. Right. But if I think for you, your 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 diamond necklace is your is love. Mm -hmm. You have to shine love. That's what they. That's what you're promoting. That's what. You, that's the promise in the work that people consume mm-hmm. from you. That's what you have to exude, you know. And, and that's how I have to show up in the world too. Yeah, if I get caught showing up, other. Which I mean, in itself, you know, uh, the act of of self love is allowing yourself to be whack. Yeah, allowing yourself to be imperfect, allowing yourself to be everything that you are. You know, I think it was was it Aubrey Marcus. I think when I first heard it from him is, you know, um, your ceiling of love is that part of you that you love the least, you know, because true love is to love something that's even remotely considered unlovable. Mm. And um, yeah, having emotions, not being perfect, that that's an act of self-love in itself. Yeah. But whereas people may think that, no, it's like, you know, love peace and, and, and joy for everybody all the time mm-hmm. i'm always happy i'm always having inner peace nobody has a no we're all humans there's it's a life is an emotional roller coaster like yes. i still have dark days yes they're not as long or as abundant as previously right it could have been a dark year yeah. now it's like eh, you know i have a dark 24 hours or maybe four hours it's because yeah. we now have the tools and i've been doing the work to practice getting out of it so it's okay to be human it's okay to mess up act out lash out but just how much are we working on our muscles to realize that that's happening for us to snap out of it and be like oh i'm in this again i'm in this cycle let me go back to over here yeah it's uh i think the the new concept that i I, i've been exploring is your standard of living versus your standard of life Mm. and it's like you don't need nice things to be grateful you just need to be grateful and you can mm-hmm. be grateful under any conditions. Yeah. And you're right. We are always going to react before we can respond. Mm-hmm. Some people will react for two days before they calm down and respond. Mm-hmm. Some people it takes two minutes. Some people it'll take, you know, 0.2 seconds. That's what we're working towards. Yeah. And we should focus on the progress. There is no perfect. And um, especially around these concepts of love, everyone thinks they have to be perfect to be worthy of love. Mm-hmm. When everybody we love everybody we love we could write a whole book about their imperfections you know yeah. and it's you love them despite their imperfections that you know so well 
So mm -hmm. why can't we afford that same love towards ourselves despite our imperfections? Mm -hmm. There's no measure. I think we also have to abandon this idea of saying you're enough. Enough is not a measurement of a human being. Mm. You can't be enough or not, you know, or, you know, worthy. Like you're worthy of love. Mm -hmm. These aren't measure. We're just using incorrect measurements. You know, it's 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 like asking for the temperature of of, of a fabric. It's not. We're not doing it right. And um, I think it goes a lot back to just our tribal times where yeah. we just felt like we needed everyone's approval to survive, which we did back then. But we don't need that anymore. You can move three blocks away and no one knows who you are and start all over. You could survive as one now. And previously, I think I heard the science was like one human, two humans, three humans, four humans. They will all die. They'll last a little longer. But I think seven's the magic number. Mm. If, if I don't recall, it was an anthropology okay. a paper that I read. Like the magic number is like seven. And at seven, there's enough to watch their backs and start thriving and reproducing and creating a tribe. Yeah. And growing from there but let's go back to enoughness because you know those are one of my conversations am i enough is it because i'm an only child and and a lot of perfection was put on not only child i'm the oldest child of a sibling and it was always you had to be perfect because your brother's looking up to you and what you're doing is that somewhere where i figured out okay i have to be enough because of that because that's put on different levels of siblings if you're in the middle or the baby or the eldest or even an only child or is it because we're always competing in society and no matter what you're in, were you good enough at football? Were you good enough at your grades? Were you good enough at work? Did you hit the bonuses? So I think enough comes from that, but I love how you say that's not the right measure. And I agree because yeah. why am I saying I'm not enough? I'm not enough compared to who? There's only one Ruben. So am I comparing myself to another Ruben? Yeah. Hopefully my last iteration of Ruben yesterday was enough that day and now i'm enough because i'm better than that person and maybe my future self could be even more enough yeah well and i think that that measurement of progress is good there yeah am i making progress am i am i better than i was yesterday or am i be and even then it decides what are we framing are, you, are we going to frame it day by day moment by moment week by week month mm -hmm. by month you know I'm, i was sitting in the studio with an artist friend complaining about his financial situation and i was like are you better off now or worse off than you were five years ago he's like better i'm like then your chart's going like this it's, it's yeah. going up and down but it's still going up it's going up yeah. right and it just depends how you frame it if you frame it this month compared to last month then you then you, you you're a failure you know yeah. failure uh failure is the frame that we use and do i have enough money to fill up my gas tank that's how you measure enough do i have enough you know time to to make it to santa monica from from noho these are measurements of enough yeah. am i enough of a person you know, that's not a measurement, Yeah. you know, and even when we think about our relationships and the people we care about, we, we never look at them in terms of their enoughness. What do they have to do? You know, there could be, have they acknowledged me enough for me to feel something? That's still not love. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, uh, interaction. That's just, you know, having emotional, physical and spiritual needs, mm -hmm. but there's still not an enoughness there, you know, and. I think we have to also just recognize that we're not, and I, and I learned this as a teacher. It was like, when I, for, for half a year, I was teaching the first grade. If you tell the kids, and we were in Toronto, so, you know, put on, your, put on your snow boots and then put on your snow pants. They put the boots on first, and then they try to put the pants on, and they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if I told you to do that, you would know the correct order, you know? But mm -hmm. at one point, you were also a simple basic human being mm -hmm. that didn't that took everything extremely literally and i think we have to pay attention to how much training we've been given red means stop green means go yeah. yellow means slow down there is so much we're in a society that wants to sell us stuff all the time and one of the best marketing tactics is you are not enough unless yeah buy our shit take our course mm -hmm. read our book Otherwise, you're not enough. Wear our makeup, you know, win, win the games, play mm -hmm. our sports, you know, fight our war, you know. So all of these agendas are, and, and we're being taught this. And we, we start to internalize it like we always knew. You know, we forgot that we didn't know how to read, you know. And I think the reminder of being around kids was like, shit, we were empty vessels at one point, And we were literally fed stuff. I mean, I look at my, I have a 16 month old right now. Yeah. So I'm looking at that every single day. Yeah. 
and, he, and, he, and he's going to soak in what you do more than what you say. And that's, that's how I'm leading right now. Yeah. Like I'm always talking about like, it's now more important than ever to me show myself self love and kindness and gentleness and compassion. Cause that's what he's seeing. Yeah. If he doesn't see me doing it to me, he's never going to learn how to do that for himself. Yeah. And now I'm just like, wow. Cause it's, I can't tell you what to do or how to do it. I can only tell you what I do, how I do it, and show it. Yeah. And if there's a contradiction between what you say and what you do, what you do is going to trump that. Right. They can see, you know, they're clever. Oh, yeah. They, they don't got much going on, so that everything that they absorb, yeah. that's it. They have no filter, no frame of reference. Everything's yeah. new. Yeah. And I think, and, and, and even for us, the thing is, like, from a scientific standpoint, I think it's like up until the age of 12, 13, we're only able to understand the world uh, in terms of duality, you know, up, down, hot, cold, good, bad, you know, the world is clearly more complex and there's a lot of gray in between, yeah. but we don't upgrade our software or our perspectives or our outlooks on that. So we still look at things mm-hmm. that, and I know I'm in therapy and my therapist said, literally my only job is to get people out of black and white thinking. Mm. Every conflict and, and trauma and issue that you have is a result of black and white thinking and all i'm trying to do is ask you questions to get you to see some gray and the quicker we and 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 again this is not we're not flawed for that our brains are growing and developing until we're like 25 26 Mm -hmm. so you know and also as a teacher i remember learning that like up until the age of nine kids haven't even developed empathy like they actually don't have it Mm -hmm. so it's amazing to see these kids like like they can be heartless but the empathy's not there. There's nothing wrong with them. Yeah, it's a cold eight-year-old, right? <laughs> yeah, they're cold, but they don't have it. Like, they don't, they're not meant to have it. Yeah. You know, those, they don't have beards either. That comes later. You know, they don't have empathy. That comes later. Yeah. You know, they have a center of the universe mentality. They don't have this, they don't, those cognitive functions are, mm-hmm. are going to be developed later. And, but they need that. It's a survival mechanism, yes. right? So he's like, I, they have to be the center of attention or else we're going to ignore them. They're, yeah. they're down here. Yeah. They're, they're, they're below us. And I don't mean that in the sense of they're not important. It's just they're literally little people. And they're, you're not seeing them at eye level unless I'm constantly looking down at him to look at him. Yeah. But it's you. I'm, I need you. You need to feed me. I'm going to die without you. So yeah. that they have to be that. Yeah. And, and even the psychological implications of that. So it's... You know, the, the evolution of empathy is attunement. So attunement is, empathy is like walk in my shoes and see how I feel. Mm-hmm. Attunement is walk in my shoes, look me in my eyes and tell me that you, prove to me that you know how I feel. Mm. You know, and that requires, and you bring it up, the icon, it requires you to get down, look yeah. them in the eyes, sometimes say I'm sorry. You know, mm-hmm. all of the things, because they can't, they can't do it. And I remember when my nephew was a kid, trying to make popsicles it came out crooked he's bawling and my sister's just like use your words use your words and he can't he's 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 a pre-human he's like yeah. six you don't know what's happening he's got two words yeah he's got two words and you know but it's it's the end of the world for him because yeah. he the popsicles he saw in the picture were straight and his are crooked and it's just a really interesting thing because you i think for me plant medicine reminds me of that because when i have plant medicine i get overwhelmed i turn into a four-year-old child Mm. and i'm just terrified but there's a voice in the back of my head like the sober voice is over here it's like oh shit like that's what she felt like when you got really mad that day and didn't give her a chance to get her words out or told her she's too sensitive for crying because her crying is the same thing as you being mad why is it okay for you to be mad and her not to cry and it's like you have these moments and because the plant medicine is like you can't control it Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like i can't close my eyes the monsters are there and i'm saying this as an adult you know and that's what these kids experiences were yeah and um that attunement is like taking yourself because we've been them they haven't been us and i think that's an interesting thing as well in in terms of the exploration of love is diving into the other's world because i think right now there's a common practice of like i love you i want you to love my favorite sports team Yep. I want you to know all my favorite songs, see all my favorite movies, know all my favorite foods. But and, and this is not just romantic. This can be any type of relationship. It should be, no, what is your mm-hmm. obsession? What is your favorite food? What is your favorite sport? Let me show you that I see you. Mm-hmm. That's the expression of love, where love is the verb, mm-hmm. you know, versus if you need to love me and, and see all my shit. And um, such a, such a, it's work. Simple, but not easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's where, you know, we, when we first met and we were talking, 
and you're like yeah i say love is a verb i'm like that's in my mission statement love mm. is a verb it's an active way of being it's caring from the heart it's an active way of life like yeah. it's doing it right you know you can say even if you say i love that car that's an active you're saying that you love that car and we, we forget and we yeah. think of it as and loving that car is making sure you don't leave that soda in the car or spilling it on the thing yeah. changing the oil on time the ma the work is loving that mm -hmm. car yeah you know saying i simply love that car and doing nothing to honor it still gotta wash it wax yeah. it oil it gas yeah. it yeah do you love that car and uh that's a great analogy right there yeah mm -hmm. so you've got so you went from unlearned your first book which was basically saying, look, I've been programmed for so long. I, I get to look at how can I unlearn this or view the world through a different lens or yeah. however you want to kind of phrase that. But ultimately it was like, this was right for this long, but now I'm seeing other and I'm seeing different. Now, what was next after unlearn? After unlearn was uh, things no one else can teach us. And that was kind of how to prime yourself to find value in everything so mm -hmm. again taking ourselves out of the, the mode of judgment and saying and, and out of the mode of duality and saying this is good this is bad and instead of saying what can i learn from this you know encouraging others to be more curious than judgmental mm -hmm. and and things no one else can teach us is me sharing stories that on the outside could just all be bad news you know of experiencing a violent robbery in new york heartbreaks not getting things the way I want, losing money, you know, my artist journey, um, the betrayals, all of these, and showing where the value in these came from. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot of language around the word healing, healing from a trauma, but the, 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 the more effective word would be integrating. Mm. You take, because healing insinuates something's wrong with you. Yeah. There's an injury. You're damaged. You're damaged. Yeah. But what you're really doing is you're integrating. So trauma is not knowing meets the intensity of life naivete meets malevolence you know like not knowing what the world is crashes headfirst into what the world is mm. you know and this world is ruthless and then you get trauma you get traumatized and then many people get cynical they get judgmental they 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 they, they lock up they they hide they shrink they lick their wounds um and some of us when we integrate the learning from that trauma and a, an easy example would be touching a hot stove. You know, we touch every single day. We're touching the hot stove of life. We didn't know it was hot. We touched it. Mm. The lesson isn't not to go near a stove. The lesson is respect the stove for being hot. That's the nature of the stove. Yeah. How to work around, how to work with that. And that's courage. That's revisiting the stove with your eyes open. Now courage is that cynical is being, I'm not going near stoves again. That's, that's not, what it is and now that burn isn't a damage that's that's a lesson mm. and that's and you're integrating the lesson so integrating the things the unpleasant experiences of life and viewing them as as jewels and diamonds and teaching ourselves to be treasure hunters where is the lesson mm. so things no one else can teach us is giving practical tips on how to find those lessons so like sometimes you got to zoom out zoom look at the story from a, a bird's eye perspective yeah. sometimes you got to zoom in Look at exactly what was happening. Um, finding, finding the blame, because and, and again, I don't want, I don't like using the word blame, but that's the word that we commonly use. Empowering yourself to taking responsibility. So mm -hmm. even if it wasn't your fault, it's still your response. If somebody hits your car tomorrow, it ain't your fault. You still got to deal with the auto mechanics, the insurance. You got to yeah. deal with that. That's your responsibility. So lying down in self-pity and being a victim, there's no value to that. So finding out where your responsibility is in this is empowering. Because mm. when you take responsibility, you take power. And if it's always somebody else's fault, then you're left powerless. And that powerlessness will lead to nihilism, which leads to depression, which leads to a whole bunch of other unpleasant experiences as well as resentment. So things no one else can teach us is just these kind of principles in terms of how to find value in everything, how to, how to turn shit to sugar. You know, like mm -hmm. a mod pretty much a uh, a non-narrative version of the alchemist. You know how to how to turn everything into gold. Yeah, and it, through you know, here are stories, here are examples. Here's how I saw it. Here's the value. Um, you know, viewing these situations as paying the tuition in life. You know, all all of the things that happened to me early in my career, dealing with shady individuals, that taught me how to conduct myself moving forward. And 
you've definitely had those experiences as well yeah. and it's like they're all lessons these people the uh, favorite quote of mine is no no one is my no one is my friend no one is my enemy everyone is my teacher mm. and that's the premise of things no one else can teach us yeah mm. Look, so two things i'm hearing an example i would give not framing it that way and i love it is every past relationship romantic relationship because sometimes i hear people say oh i wish i never dated that girl or that guy or and i'm like but why that that last relationship and the next one the next one led me to my current relationship mm -hmm. it also molded me in who i am right now that led me to the current relationship mm -hmm. and then all those lessons are now applied in my current relationship yeah. so that i can grow from it not make either the mistakes i made there or whatever the case is yeah. completely and i think the analogy I love to use is an easy day at the gym wasn't a good day. Mm -hmm. An easy day in life is not generally a good day as well. And when people, and, and one of the principles and things no one else can teach us is remember you don't own a crystal ball. Mm -hmm. like you don't know what is going to happen. And you can't change, you can't decide an outcome of a decision that didn't occur. Like, I wish I didn't date her. Okay, cool. But you don't know where that was going to lead you. Yeah. What you're really saying is I wish I can delete this three years out of my life and everything else stays the same. Mm -hmm. And that's not how life works, you know? And the coulda, woulda, shouldas don't, that's not a thing. I mean, now that the Marvel Universe is exploring the multiverse, we can explore these coulda, woulda, shouldas, but even for our reality, yeah. we're only on one path. Yeah. And again, these principles are just reminding yourself that so often it's smartest to just say, I don't know, or just to recognize, but it didn't happen. It didn't play out like that. Mm -hmm. Sitting here and wishing it did, Bring, it's, it's being in the rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but takes you nowhere. Yeah. And th these ideas, I always try to figure out where they came from or why they came or why we feel that way. Um, and I think it's very often because, we, again, we're in a culture where I'm seeing this beautiful. I'm not seeing the years that, that brought you here. Yeah. So now I want to do this. I want to skip all those steps because I don't even know there are steps. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's shades to a gradient, and you can't you can't skip a shade. You have to start by sucking, and then sucking less, and then sucking even less, mm -hmm. and then eventually that turns into good. Mm -hmm. and then eventually that might take you to great, and then that might take you to excellent or godly or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. But you can't skip steps. But we have a society, and our entertainment industry, and our heroes are all based off people that make it look easy. We don't watch Kobe Bryant practice. We watch him play. Yeah. You know, we, we don't see LeBron James practice. We watch him play. We don't see Beyonce rehearse. We see her play. And in and, and, and a chapter in the new book, I mentioned, I, I said, you can Google Beyonce falling. It's a four minute video of Beyonce making mistakes mm -hmm. in performances and challenging the viewer to ask will you see beyonce any will you love her any less after that four minute video mm. now that you see her wardrobe malfunctions falling off stage messing up her choreo yeah. not being perfect do you actually love her any less so why are we so afraid you know people don't get started because they don't yeah. want to go through that that stage of sucking and i would i like and i would ask a question this because it made me think something and now i'm thinking because i know a lot of negative people and doom and gloom type mentalities and things and thinking did someone make that video to show look she's not perfect and to sh to like revel in the mistakes for the sense of ha ha not the sense of like hey you shouldn't worship her she's not perfect she's human and you can get to her level too right yeah like I, I or is it just they're playing the attention economy and they know that here's some unique content that will go viral for that will go viral reason. and i i did and i did the work to collect it all celebrate me yeah you know. i'm just i'm curious yeah. at who made it compiled it and what was their true intention yeah because we could put whatever meaning we want if we go through the using verb as a love then we're going to look at it that way yeah. and if we look at it the other way and that that's what makes it the 50 50 thing where you yeah. only you only own 50 percent of, of of your art yeah and the other 50 percent is that person where they meet you because a six-year-old sees love what does love mean for her? A 99-year-old yeah. sees love. What does that trigger in them? It's, yeah. it's, it's not you. It's that experience. It's that. So it's the same thing. So sometimes it's like it really doesn't matter that they made it, but they made it. They, they put in the effort and the energy and the time to do it. Mm -hmm. It may have nothing to do with Beyonce. It may just literally be, my theory would always be for the attention yeah. or for the clout. 
and but they did it and now we can decide you know is it a paperweight is it a diamond is it a hammer to build a house or a hammer to crush the skull like we get to decide all of that yeah and um it's powerful to, to actually take inventory and see what tool am i using and how am i using that tool yeah am i building or destroying yeah and i think that whole idea of just like this it's taking me a while too to even have realizing that people are a product of their experiences their their traumas you know and when we talk about integrating trauma when we talk about doing the work that even in itself is a position of privilege you know like not everybody can afford a therapist yeah you know there are i know people who can and still don't but yeah. there are there are many people who can't they have no access to this they're not you know not many people can afford to eat at whole foods or air one or or you know and a three dollar meal at mcdonald's is the only option yeah and and what what will that do to their quality of living uh or their standard of living or their standard of life and it's, it's recognizing that and i had to learn that despite having empathy for that that didn't mean i had to have those people around me mm -hmm. because that wasn't creating a condition you know because now you're starting your day with someone just perfecting the art of complaining about shit yeah social media is so good at that just encouraging every, yeah everybody has everybody is a victim um, everybody's politics is starts and stops with their people mm -hmm. you know no and no one's looking beyond that everybody's voting on one subject and then everybody is shocked to see the circumstances that we're in yeah i think george carlin said it he's like shitty people vote for shitty leaders we don't want to own that we're shitty and we're only thinking about our even though statistically proved that people only vote for one or two policies yeah. and they couldn't name five policies that anybody they voted uh, goes so they for. Said, do the research for all. But imagine about of George Collin, imagine him right now putting out all his content. I mean, it's, it's bananas because everything he put out still matters. Every, you know, he has his famous one about rights and privileges and he's like, you keep calling them rights, but they're not rights, they're privileges because if they were rights, they couldn't get taken away. Yeah. And they keep getting taken away and expect more to get taken away. Mm -hmm. And he's saying that in 94. And, you know, that clip applies to Roe v. Wade. That clip applies to what's, what's coming up. Yeah. And uh, it, it's interesting. I just watched Chappelle's news. He did a speech for the theater named after him. And he's he's saying the same things that carlin said mm -hmm. where it was like if you start to police artistic expression it's no longer art yeah and that's the first step next you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna police other expression well with that note like i've seen it where certain communities police their own communities saying that this is how you rep us the way you're representing us isn't the right way but they're of the same community yeah how can you not rep yeah. your own community the right way? How are you repping it wrong? Yeah. And it's also the idea of like culture evolves. I don't, whatever cultures I'm a part of, I don't have to earn it. That's who I am. And then whatever yeah. I do is a represent, how I dress is how men from my culture dress. Because yeah. I am a man from my culture. Yeah. You know, and you know, Stephen Pressfield's War of Art talks a lot about that. Like, you know, the, the, the biggest barrier to the artist is the fundamentalist, the one who believes that yesterday contains all the answers. Mm. And that's a, that's a reflection of their fear of their power to create a future. But you know, as an artist, your stuff ain't shit if it's already out. Yeah. If, if it already exists, then why are you doing it? it has, you, you, you're here to add yeah. to the world. You're not, here to, you're not here to just recycle the past mm -hmm. and assume that these people... You know, like we're, we're we're living off of laws created by people who who could not even conceive the concept of Wi-Fi, right? But we look at their laws like it's gospel, you know, and it's against a lot of update these laws, even though you know constitutions mm -hmm. have been amended thirty, well, forty times. Yeah, and even with that, I just saw one of Joe Rogan's old stand-ups, and my wife and I were cracking up. But he was talking about Jefferson, and Jeff, he basically said. Jefferson's like, y'all did write some new shit. <laughs> like, I wrote this with a feather. Yeah. You know, it's just the stuff that's in there is, is, is considered law now. But that was hundreds of years ago, right? Like, a gun back then took how long to load? Yeah. And a gun now can unload hundreds of bullets in the same amount of time it used to take to load one. Yeah. Does that mean 
one or the other. We're not even talking about what that issue is right now, but it's just the thought of the evolution. Yeah. Where were we, where we are, and where are we going? And obviously everything's going to change and shows should how we operate. And, and that whole idea too of like context of it comes, you know, like there's the idea that the people that wrote Revelations were writing it expecting to experience it in their lifetime. Yeah. You know, and now people are reading it expecting it to happen in their lifetime. And then, you know, or now in the next hundred years or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or then people start creating meaning out of what is happening. Mm -hmm. Like, oh shit, it was hot in LA for three days in a row. That's the sign of the apocalypse. Right. And the irony of this all too is I think the oldest, one of the oldest stories ever, and I, I believe it's like the Isis, Horus, it's, 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 it's stories like, like early Mesopotamian type stories, but the analogy is the son kills the father but steals his eye and puts it in his head. And the analogy of that was you don't embrace the past. You don't deny the past. You look at the past. You discard what is no longer relevant mm -hmm. and you hold forward what is, you know. And that's what the eye represented. He, he didn't just say you're an old timer. You're, no, you have wisdom that still applies mm -hmm. to, the, to this next generation. Cool. I'll take that. Yeah. But this rest of this stuff, that don't make sense no more. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, in, in, in my heritage, I think about like, okay, cool. There's stuff in my culture that I think is beautiful. You know, somebody comes over to your house, you don't offer them food, you put the food in front of them. Yeah. That will be the rule for the next 10,000 years. Yeah. But maybe not arranged marriage, maybe not the patriarchy ideals, maybe not the subjugation of women, maybe not some of the, the racist mindsets that yeah. it might exist. And that just requires us to use our brain to be like, yo, what applies, what doesn't? And mm -hmm. things have gotten, again, black and white, where it's like, no, it's either the way we do it yesterday or you just make up a whole bunch of new shit for yeah. tomorrow. And thinking about the future, I think, is, is, is our job as artists is to create that, envision yeah. a world. And all it's just bananas how many, I just think Kaepernick, for example, is just like. Ahead of his time. That's how we say it, they're ahead of their time. Right. <laughs> and even though he didn't do anything. Right. <laughs> futuristic in any way shape or form he took a stand he took a stand which is no different than what, what a few X, black gentlemen did in King. front of hitler exactly. yeah at the olympic you know what i mean like it's and I, I was fortunate enough to to once share a meal with him and ask him like why did like you you threw away everything bro like why or do you think about that now he's like it does because i couldn't sleep because i didn't know what i didn't know I didn't know about these injustices. Yeah. I grew up in a, a, a certain isolated environment. And then I, as I got older, I started to get exposed to this stuff, even yeah. though it didn't happen to me. And then I couldn't sleep and I couldn't live the way I used to live. Because so I did what I had to do and I did it because I don't think about what I lost or yeah. what I gained. And I think it's just, that's like authentic. It's not symbolic. It's not to be a martyr or to be a hero. And I think for me, that's an expression of love in itself. Yeah. So let's transition into tomorrow. Yes. So I have had the pleasure to, you know, now we're collaborating on something and mm -hmm. you've got this beautiful new book coming out. Yes. Um, I got, you know, a little preview access. So I've kind of dug into it a little bit and, uh, you know, you do what you know what I do. So I absolutely love it. And I love what, what you're going with it because you're saying it's how to be loved, but it's really about how to love. Yeah. And I have this poem when I was going through my thing. I'm like, it's not how you love or who you love. It's to be love. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about this. And, and how would you end up on this next book that you're about to share with the world? Yeah. So what, what I've been trying to craft my life to be is things I selfishly want to learn about. I want to, I'm the kid at the front of the class mm. who likes sharing his notes. You know, the same way you watch something cool on Netflix, you want all your friends to watch it. So yeah. when I learn cool ideas, I want to share them with people. So I, mm. that's pretty much the Humble the Poet experience is I want to learn about something. I do the work. I don't mind doing the work. And then I'll simplify it. Being a third grade teacher for, for many years, I learned how to package ideas and make them lighter, mm -hmm. not use big words, not make it seem dense. Uh, not sound academically pretentious or intellectually pretentious. Don't talk down to people. Help people understand things. Because mm -hmm. putting words together is what I, that's my strength. I'm mm -hmm. not a dancer. I'm not a swimmer. I'm not a painter. I put words together. And that's my contribution. So I pick things that I care about. I pick things that I selfishly want to learn. And 
um, in the world of my relationship with my family, my, my romantic relationships, you know, I was sensing a pattern. I wasn't successful. Mm. Um, you know, I couldn't put my finger on why I couldn't be certain ways and looking around me trying to figure out what was happening. So I realized the, the art of love was something that I really wanted to learn about. And I spent years tackling it from like every angle, reading psychologists, sociologists, poets, uh, artists, spiritual teachers, religious texts, just reading it from everywhere mm -hmm. and trying to figure out like what, what, what is it? Mm -hmm. What is this thing, love, that we talk about? Um, and how can I get it? That's what it was. I, I give it to me. It's yeah. a thing. I want it. I want to be, I want to earn it. Where's I that pill? How do I encapsulate it? Exactly. And then you quickly learn, you're like, oh, like, love is everything. And if I'm not feeling it, it's because if it's raining down on me, my bucket is upside down. Mm. So there's no work to find love. The work is to turn, turn, turn the bucket, you know, receive. I can, I can deny love. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that's, I, that's where I'm not receiving it. And that comes in the simple form of like not wanting to ask for help. You know, having a friend recently say, don't deny people the opportunity to help you. Mm. You know, people, that's how people express love that yeah. help um so that that's what prompted the journey and then you just quickly realize that everything that everybody does is for love mm -hmm. the way we dress the way we act how we spend our money how we express ourselves just everything you know you eating certain foods versus other foods they're all an expression of love whether it's self-love whether it's love for other people whether it's just love for the world um the work you do you know how many people are this is the generation, you know, and I, I, this is a conversation I have with my dad because my dad was trying to wrap his head around the word passion. And, you know, he's like, what is this word passion? And why do people want to get paid for passion? Mm. You know, and then when I explained it to him, he's like, they're idiots. Yeah. We never thought about that. Just go to work. Go to <laughs> Clock in, clock out. You picked the job that paid the money. Yeah. And you did the job and you got the money. And that was the transaction. You didn't, thought, you didn't think about enjoying it or you learned to enjoy it. Yeah. You know, and again, my parents are also in arranged marriage. So it's like they were given a partner and they learned to live with each other. Mm. Um, eventually loving each other. Eventually loving each other. And, and that was probably a deeper, a deeper love. Yeah. You know, a love that may not be expressed in holding hands or saying nice things or trips to Paris. But a love that, you know, ensuring, you know, my mom has to ensure my dad doesn't cheat on his diet. Yeah. Because <laughs> the doctor said stay away from these, you know, yeah. do this, do that. So I think from that context of just like, even our love for, for the world. So we, everything we do is about love. Everybody dreams about living out their passions. Everybody dreams about having all these things. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that this is, this is, this is just the analogy of living this life, just getting stomped in the head yeah. repeatedly, you know, and it's not that you're doing what you want to do. You're doing what you have to do. Yeah. This is what you have to do. And you're able to absorb all the bullshit that comes with it because this is what you, you're, you're, you're honoring an obsession. Mm -hmm. You're honoring who you are and not honoring it would be even more damaging yeah. to anything else. But it's not this idea of like, oh, let me just cursively write love three times, collect a big check and then yeah. fuck off to Mexico for a month, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I think so for me it was really realizing how everything is about love and how the Gucci belts I'm seeing are about love and how the nice cars are about love or mm -hmm. how the carefully curated Instagram posts are about love and how counting likes, counting comments, how much that is about love and yeah. then hearing about the invisible audience and the they. You know, my audience, I, I need to keep posting. They they expect stuff. Like who the fuck is yeah. you know, it goes back to that. But it's like but it's about love. Yeah. You know, and, and the quantification of it. And then realizing how much better you and I probably had it growing up. And who's the most popular kid in school? That guy. Mm -hmm. Cool. Now it's like you can count. There are metrics. Yeah. Who's got the most followers? Who's got Score the most? Scorecards in public. All yeah, scorecards. And then the scorecards themselves are no longer even decided by human beings. Like they're all algorithmically based. Right. You know, like these, these platforms just want you to stay on the platform. Instagram just wants you on Instagram. And they will show you whatever you need to see to stay on the platform. And that's what you're going to like. You know, it's just, it's just re reaffirming your echo chamber. Yeah. And um, 
so I just started to I just started to realize how important this was, um, and also how complicated people made it. It's also you know especially when women say men are complicated, mm. like obviously yeah obviously not we're easy <laughs> we're very easy and we're so easy that we must be, they must complicate us well i mean we're, i think we also complicate us right yeah. humans are meaning making machines we want to make we everything over complicated because yeah. you're just saying everything is love and then we're like oh now i'm happy or i'm blissful or i'm excited or i'm i'm yeah. feeling jubilation like it's all feeling love yeah it, it really is and you start to just realize how much and i don't remember his name but he's a he was a now he's a life coach, but he was a, he was a personal trainer, and he said most of his work was done outside of the gym, and it was to get people to, to realize that they were worthy of what of eating healthier, yeah. of working out harder, and and the results were physical, but it was working from them from the inside out. He just taught them love, yeah. and the idea wasn't to create love. The idea was to realize like love is it's the breeze. But you're not going anywhere if your sail is closed. Open yeah. your sail, turn over the bucket. Like realize that's what it is, and seeing the parallels with this, the concept of love and God, you know, and you know, hearing different ideas about love not having an opposite, or or, or love is everything and nothing at the same time. So I think for me, that's what started. Like, the deeper I got into it, mm -hmm. that made it exciting. And at first, it was researching people who were talking about love. Then it was researching people who were talking about what they loved. And then I could extract nuggets and wisdom about love from hearing basketball players talk about basketball or hearing jazz musicians talk about jazz, hearing people talk about flow, hearing people talk about their family, hearing mm -hmm. people talk about not wanting kids to having kids and how that made them feel. Mm -hmm. Like all of these different things. Um, scientists explaining it, learning about attachment theory, all of this. Um, and then starting to realize a lot of the misconceptions and again it always goes back to programming for me everything's about unlearning so it's like it's unlearning what we were taught about love and where did that come from that came from disney that came from porn that comes from rom-coms mm -hmm. that comes from all these places that create these expectations valentine's day valentine's day and again a lot of these are designed to entertain us and sell us shit yeah and having conversations with friends and saying like hey i think you and that guy how come you guys aren't dating? Well, I don't feel the spark with him. And then being like, well, the science shows that the spark is actually your, 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 your fight or flight yeah. triggering. Your, that spark that you're feeling is actually wanting to run the other way because they're just reminding you, they have the similar flavor of your trauma, you know? And all of us will lean towards what's familiar versus what's healthy. And what's familiar is generally in the world of love, it's seeing wh wh whatever flawed adults raised us. And wanting that because we, we feel prepped for that. Mm. And again, like there's, there was a study done, I think with 1,100 couples who were together for more than a decade. And I think it was less than 8% have a story about a spark. Mm. Like the spark is not an indicator of a successful marriage, you know, but that's the, that's the stuff that we're shown in, in the movie. And we're not shown the dead, the, the dead time in between. Yeah. You know, we're not shown paying the visa bill after that trip to Paris, yeah. you know. So you start to realize that how much of this influences what we care about and what we measure. And um, so, so that just got me even more interested. And then you just start to realize, like, this is everything. Like, there yeah. is nothing else to talk about after this. Like, this is love. Love is everything and why we do it. So that's what got me into it. And then it was like, I want to simplify it. I want to simplify it to the point where this is the last book about love you need to read. And you'll never call love complicated ever again, mm. you know. And again, and, and I'm distinct to find the difference between this is the simplest book about love. This won't make love easy, you know. Yeah, it's you know it's simple to lose weight, eat less calories than you burn. That doesn't make it easy. Correct. You know. So this book will make love simple. It will simplify it. It will it will hash away the junk. Now, if you choose to do it, that that's up. To, you know, that's it's up to you. you. Yeah. If I choose to do it, it's up to me. You know, I can I can contradict I can contradict the the wisdom in this book as well. Yeah. You know, I might just be more aware of it while I do it because yeah. I wrote the book. But you know, I'm choosing French fries over broccoli all the time. Yeah. You know, knowing all that, day I love fries. Yeah, I love it too. And I think that's what I realized: the simplicity is bringing it down. That's as far as you can take something. You can mm -hmm. just take it down to what's gonna feel good right now: the French fries. What's gonna feel good in the long run: the broccoli. That's yeah. all we can do with even with love. And I can and 
this is me doing the work, reading the psychologists, reading the philosophers, reading all of that mm-hmm. and, and condensing it down into the, the bite-sized nuggets that mm-hmm. people are used to now. And if you read any of my books, everything is, 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 is Instagrammable. And it's not meant for Instagram, but it's just meant for people to take these ideas and, and, and soak them in that way. Yeah, and just just keep it easy. It's a bite-sized thing. So even if you take it one page at a time, well, I'm going to acknowledge you for doing all that work for us. I can't wait to see the finished book, and I'm Mm. excited for people to dive into it. For sure. But uh, if if I'm going to ask, what are three tips right now to, like, tease the simplest way people could just be love? Recognize that love, treat love exclusively like a verb. Mm Mm-hmm. So realize love can come from you, um, and it's an endless well. So love is a gift. It's not a loan. Mm. So view it, don't give it out hoping to get something in return. View it as a gift mm. uh, and realize that it's, a unlimited, it's an unlimited resource. So giving it away does not take anything from you. Mm. Um, the only potential you're allowed to fall in love with is your own. Mm. Do not fall in love with anybody else's potential. The only potential you're allowed to fall in love with is your own. Um, there's so many rules. I think was, we're at 60, 61 chapters in this book. Um, yeah. Yeah. 61 I have chapters. it in PDF. It was pretty. Yeah. It's, and every chapter is short. Every chapter is about two yeah, or three yeah. pages, but there's 61 of them. Um, authentically be your own best friend Mm. authentically you know what it authentically and then probably one for the parents ensure your kids have friends Mm. that's the first lesson they have where they where they can understand life exists outside of them and they can care for something more than themselves because they're their actions are, are like as I said, they're still developing. That's self indulgence. Yeah. Um, they need a they need they need a they need a friend. Um, they need a best friend. But as we get older, we can have humans that are our best friends. But we need to authentically treat ourselves better. And and again, a best friend that's everything from a kiss on the cheek to a kick in the ass. Yeah. You know, be that best friend to yourself. Um, and you and I both know, as self employed individuals, we have the worst boss mm-hmm. we've ever worked for. And as employers, we have the worst employee who's ever worked for us, <laughs> yep. you know, and the only thing that the only antidote to that is grace. It's it's mm-hmm. it's be like, hurry the fuck up is the same as, hey, buddy. Hey, champ, let's go. We can do this. Mm-hmm. You know, we we schedule that vacation for the end of the month. Let's mm-hmm. let's let's go hard. Let's do this. We can make this happen. Yeah. And are you really you're, you're actually tired. All right. Go back to bed. You know. Or, or is it, okay, why are you tired? Spent all night sleeping last night, uh, drinking last night? Okay, let's, let's promise not to do that for the rest of the week. Versus yeah. you fucking moron, why the hell do you keep doing this shit? Like, exactly. Nothing, it's, it's just nothing comes from it. You don't get the results you want. So authentically be your best friend, be kind to yourself. And yeah. the, this book is, is separated by three major, major sections, which is um, love for yourself, love for others, and love for everything else. Mm. And love for yourself being the most important. And you'll see the parallels. And if we address that, that love for self, that self-love, um, and not just a superficial self-love. It's like self-love is not bubble baths and a skincare routine. Yeah. Self-love is literally loving yourself. Because we romanticize these martyr being martyrs, loving mm-hmm. people more than we love ourselves. You know? Yeah. And um, probably lastly as well, I know this is more than three, just as the ideas keep, come back in my head. Um, the people in our lives, especially our romantic relationships, these are people granting us access. You know, we have to abandon romanticizing somebody as in, in terms of ownership. That is not your person. Mm. They have granted you access to them. You, you have a big, wide, open window to them, but it's a window nonetheless. Honor that window and then you know, create a wall around you. Yeah. And don't let anybody else have, have more access to what you guys have between you. Um, but people aren't property. And I think that will save a lot of people heartache. Yeah. And, and again, I'm writing this for my 14 year old nephew. Yeah. Hoping that, you know, he has, he has these gems before life kicks his ass. Yeah. He's like, Oh wait, that makes sense now. Versus us having to process this stuff as it happens. Yeah. I love the relationship one. Cause 
it, we asked for permission. We asked for permission to be in it. And now the window's open. Let's keep that permission yeah. going. Yes. So last question. How do you define living a life through love? I view love as a fuel and not glue. So when I look at things through a lens of love, it means I have the energy to do the work. Um, so when I don't want to do it, I don't, I don't attribute that to a lack of love. If I don't want to get up in the morning and work out, that doesn't mean I don't love it. Mm -hmm. If I don't want to get up and write, that's, that doesn't mean there's a lack of love. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes we associate the love with keeping things together. Mm -hmm. Love does not keep people together. It does not keep companies together. It does not keep a society together. Love is a fuel that will make us do the very hard work to keep things together. And that is a perpetual journey. Yeah. That's infinite. That's not a, you achieve it and you're done. And again, we see this in the films. The guy, the guy gets the girl at the end, they live happily ever after. There yeah. is no happily ever after. There's a day after. There's always a day after until yeah. there isn't a day after. And I think that's an important, it's not, we have to be mindful of how we let, we, 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 we word these. Like even the idea of balance, you have to find a balance. It's like, where do we see actual balance? Somebody on a, on a, on a thin wire, mm -hmm. do they achieve balance once and now it's, now it's forever? Nope. No, it's a still. constant, and it's constant energy, it's constant activating your core. Mm -hmm. That's what life is, that's what love is. So what I realize is it's constant, it's constant service, it's constant. It's, it's what you did yesterday, or uh, I, think, I think it's the idea from the Bhagavad Gita, you are only entitled to the labor. Mm. not the outcome and for as i said love is the verb love is the work yeah and you are only entitled to the work uh you're only entitled to the rainbow not the whether the pot of gold comes is a whole different story yeah and um to live in life through love for me is that work and it's endless and the measurement of of of, of it is progress not perfection nothing will ever be perfect but we can easily measure progress are we doing better today or last week or last year than we mm -hmm. are now? That's the important question that we should ask. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here with us. Yes. Thank you for having me. Man. Love is doing the work. Yes. And where can everybody find you? They can find me at HumbleThePoet.com. All social medias, HumbleThePoet. Thank you so much for tuning in to Live Through Love. If you love this episode, you'll love this episode.